Rolle's theorem is about guaranteeing the existence of a critical point. So here's the setup. You have two x values, let's call them a and b. They should be different, so we might as well call a the smaller one. And we have a function so that my y value at a and my y value at b are the same. That is, f of a and f of b are the same. And I want to guarantee that there's some critical point between here. Now what we saw in class is that if you have a discontinuous function, you can avoid a critical point. If you have a singular point, that's where the derivative doesn't exist, then you can avoid a critical point. But what Rolle's theorem says is as long as your function is continuous and differentiable, then you're forced to have at least one critical point between a and b. There's at least one value c between our two x values a and b, such that f prime of c is equal to zero. A use we saw for Rolle's theorem was determining how many roots a function has. Remember, a root is when a function is equal to zero, and if it has more than one root, well, if it has a root at a and a root at b, that means f of a is zero and f of b is zero, so that means f of a is equal to f of b, and that's exactly what we had in Rolle's theorem. So the question is, how many roots does this function have? Let's start by figuring out how many critical points it has. Its derivative is cosine x minus 1 half, so it's a critical point when cosine of x is equal to 1 half. If we look on the unit circle, cosine of x being equal to 1 half means that I have an x value of 1 half, and this is going to happen at pi thirds and minus pi thirds. And of course, it's also going to happen if I add 2 pi to either of those things. So actually, we have infinitely many critical points. So at first glance, having infinitely many critical points doesn't help us very much, because uh, bounding the number of critical points means we bound the number of roots. The more roots we have, the more critical points we have. So if we don't have too many critical points, we don't have too many roots. But here I have infinitely many critical points. So we can be a little bit more sophisticated. Let's think about this f of x is sine x minus x squared. Suppose I have a root of my function. Suppose my function is equal to 0. Well, sine of x is always between 1 and minus 1. So if sine of x is between 1 and minus 1, and the function is 0, that means x over 2 is also between 1 and minus 1. So I also know that my roots are only going to occur when x is between minus 2 and 2, right? If x is bigger than 2, then I have sine x minus something bigger than 1, it's going to be negative, it's not going to be 0. If x is less than 2, then my function is sine x minus x over 2, at minus x over 2 is going to be greater than 1, is going to be a positive number. So I can restrict my search. I can only look for values between minus 2 and 2. So now let's look back to these critical points at pi over 3 and minus pi over 3. Pi over 3 is about a little more than 1. Minus pi over 3 is a little less than 1. So certainly I have these two critical points between minus 2 and 2. And the next time that cosine of x is a half, is if I add 2 pi to either one of those. And that's going to knock it outside of the range that we care about. So within this range, there are only two critical points. So this seems like it might be helpful. At this point, we have a pretty good feeling we're going to use Rolle's theorem. So let's make sure that the hypotheses of Rolle's theorem are fulfilled. Rolle's theorem says you have to be continuous and differentiable on this interval. And indeed, our function is continuous and differentiable everywhere. So we found out that roots can only be between minus 2 and 2. And when I'm between minus 2 and 2, I only have two critical points. So I claim that means I can have at most three roots. Let's go back to Rolle's theorem. Suppose I have four roots. That's going to look like this. The function is 0 in four different places. And because the function is continuous and differentiable, Rolle's theorem tells me I'm going to have a critical point between each pair. So that means on this interval defined my by four zeros, I should have three critical points. But all of my zeros happen between minus two and two. So let's put these all together. If I have four zeros or more of my function, 
First off, they all happen between minus 2 and 2, and that's just a characteristic of our particular function. But second off, Rolle's theorem is going to tell us that I must have three critical points between minus 2 and 2. But we saw that we only have two critical points between minus 2 and 2. So that tells us we can't have that fourth root. We can have at most three roots. Once more, Rolle's theorem tells us we have at most three roots from minus 2 to 2. But looking at the function tells us that all of our roots are between minus 2 and 2. So that means we have at most three roots anywhere. So I asked you to investigate the number of roots of this function, and we've shown that it has at most three. It absolutely cannot have four, but we haven't shown that it has exactly three. We've just shown it can't have four, but it could have, say, two. So to really finish this problem, we have to find those three roots, or show that there's not three roots. Now this is a good time to go back and start reviewing what we've done. We've actually learned a whole lot in this class, and it's easy to sometimes forget what we've learned. Uh, but at this time of year is when a young person's thoughts turn to final exams. So maybe let's review how we can show that this has at least three roots. Again, Rolle's theorem tells us it has at most three. We have to show the number is not zero, one, or two, and that'll show that the number is precisely three. So first off, it's pretty easy to see that f of zero is equal to zero. So one root is x equals 0. Now we need to find the other two, but it's a little harder to stare at this and figure out what they ought to be. So let's try and get a little better idea by drawing a graph. And I want this graph to be sort of accurate. So if this is 1, this is 1, 2, 3, pi is about here. 1, 2, 3, pi is about here. So sine of pi over 2 is 1, and sine of pi is 0, and sine of minus pi over 2 is minus 1, and sine of minus pi is 0. So this is something like y equals sine of x. So now I'm going to draw the line y equals x over 2. And note that if f of x is 0, that is if sine of x minus x over 2 equals 0, that's the same as saying that sine of x equals x over 2. So roots of f of x are equivalent to the points where sine of x is equal to x over 2, where these graphs intersect. And indeed, we see they intersect at 0. And the way I've drawn it, it seems very suggestive that we should have actually three points where these graphs intersect, which means three points where f of x is equal to 0. So we found one of them, but the other two are pretty hard to compute. But we don't have to find what they are. We just have to show they exist. So the trick for doing that is the intermediate value theorem. So it looks like one of them should be around, I don't know, 2, and the other one should be around minus 2, but probably a little smaller. So let's use that to try and show that we've got some more roots of f of x equals sine x minus x over 2. So remember, if I want to show this is 0 in some interval, I should show that it's positive and negative in that interval. Now I know that sine can achieve 1, but it certainly doesn't achieve 1 at 2. So sine of 2 is less than 1. 2 over 2 is equal to 1, so at 2, I get that my function is negative. Now I want to find a place close by where it's positive. So let's try pi over 2. That's going to make sine of x really big. I'm going to get sine of pi over 2 minus pi over 2 over 2, which is pi over 4. So this will be 1 minus pi over 4. Now pi is less than 4, so if I subtract pi, that's going to give me something bigger than if I subtract 4. So I see here that it's positive. So remember that we already said f is continuous for all real numbers. We need that to be true in order to use the intermediate value theorem. Now because I found something greater than 0 and something less than 0 between pi halves and 2, I know that f has a root somewhere in the interval from pi halves to 2. So indeed, my picture isn't lying. There should be some root there. Now we can do exactly the same thing for the other side. If I try f of minus 2, I get sine of minus 2 minus minus 2 over 2, which is sine of minus 2 plus 1. And sine, it can reach minus 1, but certainly sine of minus 2 is not minus 1. So this is greater than minus 1 plus 1, so it's positive. 
and f of minus pi over 2 is going to give me sine of minus pi over 2 minus minus pi over 2 over 2, which is minus minus pi over 4. Sine of minus pi over 2 is minus 1, and I get plus pi over 4. And again, pi over 4 is less than 1, so this whole thing is less than 0. So again, because my function is continuous everywhere, by the intermediate value theorem, I have a root in the interval from minus 2 to minus pi over 2. So now I've actually shown that three roots exist. There's one in this interval, there's one in this interval, and there's one at 0. And those three roots, no two can be the same because these intervals don't have any overlap. So I've shown that my function has three distinct roots, and I've also shown that it can't have four. So in fact, the number of roots I have is precisely 3.